Okay. Okay. So thanks. Uh, thanks very much, Bill, for the for the warm introduction. Really, really appreciate it. Uh, and uh, thanks all for all for being here for the for this presentation. So imagine a world where we, as business founders, owners, and leaders, have high performing, growing, and increasingly valuable businesses that are fully engaged the talents and passion of our teams, make a positive difference in the world, and free up our personal time. We'd like to feel like this, wouldn't we? Wind at our back, crashing through the waves, all the team aligned. Great aspiration. I'm sure we can all agree. But the reality is the vast majority of businesses struggle to meaningfully scale. In Australia, 84% stay under $5 million. 15% get in the five to $50 million zone. And a tiny 1% manage to crack through the $50 million barrier. So growth has proven hard for most of our businesses. There's something in the way. Profits also have been elusive. I found this quote from Phil Ruthven at Ibis World. Um, terrible stat, 3.7% return on shareholders' funds. And uh, interestingly, this is about half of what the equivalent USA-based firms get. Turns out they've got greater intellectual property leverage over there and actually a much more aspirational business culture. So their driving returns are significantly ahead of what we're achieving in Australia. Also, engagement levels are still too, are still too low. Many of you would have seen this in your own businesses. Um, you know, look at the actively disengaged um, stat here from, uh, from Gallup's research a couple of years ago, 13%. Um, they're the people that are act actually um, doing zero in your business apart from damaging it. Um, the engaged is only about a third of the team and the real opportunity for us lies in that 52%, over half the people who are punching the clock, picking up the pay, doing the basic job, but not really bringing their heart and soul to the work. What about owners and leaders? They're feeling real pressure. Long hours, but struggling for impact. And frankly, most of them are carrying too much of the operational load, stuck much more in the business than working on it. You know, most it won't surprise people on this call working longer than 40 hours a week. Um, a number of them continuously overwhelmed, not just occasionally. And, and look, I hear this from leadership teams. Um, the, the stat that struck me most out of this advisory board report was one and a half highly productive hours per day. That is the things that are most important that I should be working on are getting a tiny amount of my attention. Um, importantly too, uh, meetings are generating very little value and, uh, and yet still with all the effort they're putting in, about half of these leaders say that the non-productivity of their team is their fault. So whilst we wanted this, the reality is that we're actually living like this. Pulling an anchor through rocks and you know, likely it's uphill and into a breeze, isn't it? I mean, it's just uh, the, the challenge that we're facing. Does this all feel eerily familiar to you? If you're a business owner or a leader or a founder, it probably does. And you know, from it certainly does to me, I've seen all this from many different facets over the 35 years of my commercial career. You know, starting life in accounting gave me an insight into the financial performance aspects of business. Whilst the subsequent move into consulting was more about implementing systems and processes and projects that get things done. Later, as a partner and part owner of a leadership advisory practice, um, I got to see the criticality of the people side as I um, appointed uh, senior leaders, reviewed organisational performance and reviewed boards of management. But you know, most recently as a coach and advisor, I've had an increasing focus on the underlying belief system in businesses, helping with the strategic choices that leaders need to make and the connective tissue that must be in place to enable success. So why is this important? Across my roles as an employee, director, owner, advisor, I was aware of the substantial economic and social outcomes that a healthy business sector delivers. But what I did notice was the dysfunctions and lost opportunity. Uh, so in my view, the mid-market firms, uh, who's the, the kind of the, the, the heart of business in Australia, have a huge opportunity to make a difference. And my personal goal is to help 5,000 of them over the next decade. My propelling performance book is part of my strategy to do that. So I'd, I'd like to provide an overview of my thinking. So 
my framework has seven key elements, uh, which I'll, I'll give an overview of, and, and they really fall into the, the topic title of this book, um, the energies, the enableness and, and the effectiveness uh, that I want to talk with you about. We'll check in to see which of these might be an opportunity for you in your own business and also dig a little deeper into a couple of the pieces towards the end of the presentation that my clients and some of my contacts have found particularly useful. So in the first instance, there are, there are three spheres of energy that I, um, I think are important in uh, that underpin business success. So in the first instance, we need to start thinking of our business much less like a machine and much more like the living organisms that they really are with their own energy spheres around spirit, mind, and body. For the most senior leader, it's useful to start considering the role as chief energy officer rather than chief executive officer. Of course, the executive function mostly relies to, you know, if you look at the definition, the power to put plans or actions into effect, which is just one part of the model over there in the achieve section. So think of ourselves as managing energy uh, rather than managing people or things um, or strategies per se. So what do we believe? This is the first sphere in my model and it covers the foundations that every high growth business creates before reaching sustained breakthrough and includes your business's purpose, values and vision. Purpose, as many of you would know, relates to the why we do what we do whilst the values are more around the handful of rules that we've got in our business that govern our behaviour. And vision is our inspiring statement of what could be. It's, it's our noble quest. Nailing this piece of the, the puzzle will both direct everything you do as well as fuel everything you do, provides the emotional and spiritual energy that gives energy, resilience, keeps the business moving forward while absorbing the inevitable knocks along the way. What about the conceive stage? In this sphere, things are starting to get more concrete, informed by those guiding principles of the believe stage. Conceive sphere focuses on the creating the strategy and the business model to achieve your vision and live your purpose within the values construct that you have. This represents how you think about the business, drawing out its intellectual energy. The strategy itself captures the differentiating choices that you'll make, whilst the business model describes how we'll put those pieces together, whilst risk management is the sense check on the risks we're accepting and areas of concern. Businesses that don't tackle this stage will drift, have lower focus, tend to behave reactively and only address challenges that get thrown their way rather than working towards a shared goal. Next, the third energy is around achieve. This is the sphere that puts in place that need to be implemented to execute your strategy effectively. It's about getting clear on what you do. The right processes are those that enable the necessary and sufficient activities to deliver promised value from your business. Whilst the organizational structure is the vehicle or bones that give the business its physical shape. The crucial final piece is then populating it with the right people into the right roles, ensuring a match of both values and capability fit. Once you have these pieces in place, your business will be focused on the activities that are most highly aligned and profitable, and your people will be empowered to get the most important pieces of work done and done well. Friction decreases, momentum starts to build. Really interesting. Okay, so um, so take a uh, get a, a glimpse of those so you can just see how maybe your position, what others are thinking as well. Um, I just uh, it's it's really interesting that um, that it's coming over as the uh, that the belief side is coming over um, uh, quite strongly for people. Um, that is uh, that's really interesting and the weakest in actually the operational uh, more the operational execution. Okay, the next uh, the next piece is that there are three enabling blades in my model that that uh, help move the energy around that performance model: aspiration, activation, and escalation. Let's uh, let's talk through each of them. The first one is aspiration, uh, joining believe um, and uh, and conceive. Then we have activation between conceive and achieve, and finally escalation. Okay, so firstly to aspiration. The aspiration um, is in this position because really what it does in the first instance, we take um, the, um, the, uh, the big, hairy, audacious goal um, and crystallise really from what we believe into what is our aspiration for the company. The BHAG, as Jim Collins called it, puts a number 
to our aspiration and, uh, and starts to make the things that we believe a bit more real. With that, the, the other thing we need to get clarity on, having clarified our own aspiration, is to clarify the aspiration of our customer. Uh, what, what are they trying to get done? And then to ground those aspirations in reality, what are the competencies that you rely on to deliver all of this? In short, this section draws out what do we really want? What do we want as a business? What do our customers want from us? And what's our capability to deliver on those wants in a competency sense? Okay, under activation, this is how we connect strategy at the conceived stage to the operational side of the business and the changes that need to occur to implement the strategy in the achieve sphere. During activation, you translate your thinking into action by communicating strategy with your people. As they'll be carrying it out, the way your team receives the strategy will be a demonstration of their commitment. At this stage, it's also critical to be clear about accountability for delivering on the agreed priorities and to declare the measures that will track progress. This part answers the question, what's most important? The third enabling blade is escalation. It reconnects all the actions taken by a business back to what we believe. In the first instance, reflection on success and failure allows you to extract important learnings to position your business for its next upward spiral. Celebrating achievements puts energy back into your business and reinforces those beliefs, which ensures they continue to inform business decisions. It's then time for a reset. It takes learnings from what we've already achieved, holds them up against where we're headed and guides us to the next set of choices. We're building a cadence through here where the more important things continue to go right, the more positive reinforcement goes through the business, the more valuable the business becomes and the easier it is to move up from strength to strength. It's up to you to set and define that stage of growth. And it answers the question really for business, what's next? The final piece of the propeller dead center is leadership. Leaders are those people who help connect and energize all of the spheres and ensure the enabling blades keep turning. Leadership's a critical spindle that drives the success of the propeller model. Leaders help guide the speed of delivery, the power it generates, thus dictating the altitude to which your business ascends, how fast that journey is, and importantly, how smooth the ride. Leaders drive the process of making the ethereal beliefs inform sensible, tangible concepts and decisions, which can then be elegantly executed. Great leaders practice all three crucial elements, leading themselves, leading their team and leading the business. This final part challenges leaders with the question, who do I need to be? Okay, so yes, look, simple to, uh, simple to and clear to agree with the model. Principles easy to agree with, aren't they? Like a lot of that would make sense. You know, in my, in my library behind me, I've got uh, over 400 leadership books and in various ways they tap into a lot of the ideas that I've, um, I've shared so far. So yes, that sounds great, but like, what, what's the problem? So my sense is there are, there are some key challenges. Firstly, that there are gaps in the spheres. So we, we may have effort, and, and you reflected on this in your responses to the polls, there, there, are, there are some parts of the energy that we manage in the spheres aren't as strong as others. So we've got some imbalances in those, if you like, those cylinders pumping in the business. We've got some missing blades too, haven't we? We've, we've probably got some enablers that need more work. I mean, we just talked right now about the... Um, uh, the need for the activation uh, blade. Well, more than half of you um, needed uh, needed some uplift. And also, I think there's some uh, some leadership dysfunction in terms of that central spindle that um, uh, that will help us. So I call uh, I call the first part of this the uh, the pain of partial propulsion, and. Uh, um, what what uh, what we see here is that we've got some uh, we've got some dreamers, we've got some doers, and we've got some drifters. And so, you know, the basically what this is is that the um, uh, the the dreamers are people who who have a um, uh, uh, they've got the belief system sorted out, um, they've they've got a strategy, but they actually don't have the strong execution piece that you would normally find in the achieve in the achieve side. Um, the drifters, on the other hand, are, um, are people who uh, probably started their business with a great foundational purpose and idea um, and probably a strong vision. Um, they've got some uh, achievement orientation in terms of they've operationalized it, but they haven't, they're a bit directionless because they haven't done the strategy piece under conceive. 
Uh, and the doers are people who have a strategy, um, they execute against it, but there's really no um, belief system in the business. So in a, in a sense, they're a very mechanical, machine-like business. And so that, that to me is, um, is a gap. So I, I tend to think, and your answers before probably uh, showed a bit of this, um, there, there's, there's probably an essence of dreamers, drifters and doers. That's, um, so that, that's an area of, of uh, work uh, that I see needs to be done. And so why do some of these issues come up? I mean, the, the, um, lots of business have had ended up in a, in a bit of a, a stall as, I, as the subtitle of my book says. And so I think part of it is we've got what I'd call accidental leaders. Uh, many of us, probably most of us, started off as functional um, uh, operators in some way. You know, I started off doing accounting. Some people would have done law or engineering. Um, I've had surveyors as clients and um, uh, folk who, who sell trucks. And, and like, there's a huge breadth of, of people, health professionals. Um, uh, we've started off in that functional role. But through our success in that functional role, we've often become a leader. It might be in a business we've founded or in one we've grown up uh, in the leadership of. But, you know, it, it's, it's by dint of our success that we've become an accidental leader. But those accidental leaders, unfortunately, lack a framework. Typically, none of us have had much of a playbook to start. And I know it was certainly the case um, early in my leadership career. I, I knew I had all the levers had been, had been given to me to lead uh, that part of the business. Um, but where do you start? And so, um, so hence, you know, part of my driver to, uh, to provide a framework to make it easier for people to lead. The other part of it is I, my, my insight is that we tend to evolve in this direction, uh, anti-clockwise. Often people starting off operationally doing something, or perhaps they've started even earlier with, with some sort of um, uh, vision or, or, um, or value set that they've operationalized through the Achieve. They've got their uh, products and services going and at some later point they might decide they need a need a strategy and so on however the game works like this in my view we're actually energized in the first instance and that's why my model un unwrapped in the way i explained it that we that we found the business on our beliefs and we use those to inform um, uh, and find out what the aspirations are use that to drive our conceive stage the strategy the model and the risks we then use the activation stage to bring that to life. And we, we put that to work in the achieve stage through the processes that we develop, the structures that we sit them in and the people that we get on board to deliver them. We're then in escalation, reflecting on those. How did all that work? Um, let's celebrate the wins we had and do a reset. And it's the leader's job right in the middle there to work out how fast those blades are going to spin um, how steep the climb is going to be, what their role in the business will be, uh, how they lead the team. And, and bear in mind, this piece around leadership um, in a survey I read accounts for more than 50%. It was actually 52% of business success is the capability of people to lead. It's not whether you've got a good product or service or not. Um, it's not about your margin or those sorts of things. It's how, are you able to actually bring that, bring that leadership power to bear? So what, what, must we do? So we need to be clear about the destination. You know, what does success look like to us in our business? Against that backdrop, where are you now in the business? And then what's, what's the interference? In coach training, we learned that um, performance, our performance equals our potential minus interference. Performance equals potential minus interference. So the interference, by the way, might well be hiding in the step before the symptoms show up in this model. So, um, so for example, if you're having trouble um, in the uh, in the achieved phase, which many which many of the responses in the survey said, I'd be looking in the in the um, in the activation piece. Are we good enough with accountability? What about the metrics? You know, has the strategy been communicated well enough? This is this is where we start to drive out. Um, better performance in the achieve in the achieve energy sphere, and then it's a case of committing to the work. What I've noticed is the most successful businesses create their own certainty through clarity of their beliefs, alignment on their strategy, deciding the critical few priorities, assigning accountabilities to do them, 
installing metrics, building the operating system that delivers, populating with a great team and having a cadence of review that maintains momentum. In short, they make things happen. So to go deeper on this, to actually give you a couple of examples of, um, of where I've seen uh, this work in actual uh, practice, um, to put some um, real case study side behind it, uh, I want to talk to you about um, a couple of cases that I've been uh, uh, looking at that will, um, that will help you. So in the first instance, um, let's pick values out of the, um, out of the Believe uh, energy sphere. So um, Dimple was one of my first clients. Um, uh, they are a, um, a foot care business. So basically they do aged um, uh, foot care in aged care centres. So as Damien, the founder, said to me, this is um, this this work. He says, not a sexy business. I've got a, I've got 80 people going around filing and cutting the nails of elders, right? But the, the important thing for us is the power of, of what he of what he set up here. So this has been significant for many clients, and that's why I wanted to show it here. Um, and yet, look, to be honest, years after these values were created, I still get a touch of motion when I see them as they truly represent what Dimple stands for. Notice the tailored language here. You know, th these, these, aren't, these aren't values that somebody Googled world's best values. You know, these have been distilled from, from what the founder and their, and their team actually believe. So it's based off um, Damien James's vision, you know, and, and so thinking about vision. We want to celebrate aging, not just, and I'll, I'll read what he wrote here. We want to celebrate aging, not just for what has been that, not for that has been achieved over the years, but for the now. Through our vision, we hope to reset the way that elders are valued and respected by society, as well as um, the degree of optimism they share towards aging. They brought to, these to life in numerous ways. At regular all hands gatherings, they had a values based shine award, and they also had a thing called the fairy dust fund, where any staff member could spend up to fifty dollars to make an elder's day better. So they might have known they loved Mario Lanza music, right? So so that carer could actually go out and grab a Mario Lanza CD, charge it to the company, and take it to the take it to the elder next time they went there. Buy them a bunch of flowers for their birthday, fix their TV aerial, doesn't matter. Um, go beyond, be loved, do right. Okay. And so very powerful stuff. The other thing that's interesting here is that um, you'll see that they've got symbols there for each of these, right? So when you're doing things like awards, um, it's great where you can connect people back to the symbols of what these, what these awards, uh, what these values stand for. And it's also about the, the behavior language under each, under each of these, you know, say with do right. Do right strip bear means we, we try to do what we say we'll do. It's fairness personified, you know, it's this sort of language. It's not, it's not getting something out of the dictionary, you know? So that, that's a great example of, um, of what a good set of values will look like. So, you know, the same with be loved and go beyond, you know, it's about job descriptions, the starting point going beyond is doing extra things to make someone's day, week, perhaps even year. And so, it, hence, um, the, the connection between these values and what people actually did. Uh, too many sets of values, in my opinion, are um, somebody um, uh, thinks about them, maybe gives it the marketing department, they get stuck on a, on a, um, on a little piece of uh, uh, pl plastic or maybe etched in glass by the truly ambitious and put on the front desk. Um, but people don't actually believe them. Um, at Dimple, people believed in these values and they actually lived them. And uh, the, the authenticity and congruence that you get out of this in that top energy sphere um, of, uh, for your business is extremely powerful. And so it's an early piece of work I do with all my clients is to make sure they get really clear on their values. Uh, the next uh, one, um, the customer. You remember, uh, customer was one a thing, a piece we talked about under the aspiration uh, enabling blade. So, a business that's done this really well is UCS. So, again, and, and I'll pick this example. Uh, likewise, these are not sexy businesses. UCS dig trenches and put cables in them to connect up greenfield housing estates. Right? So, they're not they're not a Silicon Valley sexy tech business or anything like that. Right. So. Um, but what, what we did, they've taken a strong position to understand their customer. 
Um, their clients are major developers who rely on, the, on UCS for the success of their key projects and hence safe, on time, first time. Right? These, these pieces were not invented. They were distilled from a deep understanding of their core customer. And then to make sure it stuck, their CEO, Steve Ellich, had this brand promise embedded into their logo, uh, put on their buildings, as you, can, as you can see in the background there, um, stuck on the side of all their vehicles. So you can see it's on the ute door there. Uh, it's on their uniforms. Uh, it's inside the building, as you can see in the picture on the right. Um, this, this thing is everywhere. So it's on their recruitment page alongside their purpose and values. So this is what we believe, purpose and value for us. This is what we do for the customer. And so um, the, the other, the other uh, part, they make strategic decisions based on these promises. So uh, for example, um, they uh, uh, last year invested in an audit function uh, to ensure they can deliver on their promise because one of the challenges is when you're a last mile service like these guys, if you don't get your work done on time, the development can't um, you have its full financing, release, project closure, and so on. So uh, although in uh, relative terms, these guys are a small part of the work, they're a really critical part of the work. So hence being safe is inarguable on time and getting, getting your um, electrical certification passed first time is really important in their industry. So that's what they live by and they make strategic decisions in the business to make sure. And so we ask the questions, is this safe? Is it helping us be more on time? Is this helping us do things first time? And so they will invest and overinvest in things that help them do that because they know uh, that that's what the customer expects of them. It's extremely powerful to be able to, um, uh, to, be able to uh, drive things in that way. And then picking up one from the, the um, uh, activation piece, measurement. Uh, this is another one that, um, that I, I don't think is, is done well enough. And um, over, in, uh, over at SRC, Springfield Remanufacturing uh, Company in Springfield, Missouri, um, they play business like a game. And their, their founder, Jack Stack, uh, knew that people got engaged in the excitement of sport, and yet business didn't, didn't seem to run that way. So um, basically what Jack did, short story, and if you ever if you go to the US, um, reach out to me and I'll, I can get you into um, uh, SRC. It's an incredible uh, business to see. Um, they, they have metrics for everything. So he's inculcated keeping an eye on the score as a religion in all the SRC businesses. So there are TV screens, whiteboards, um, actual traffic lights um, in, their, in their break room uh, with you know, red, green and orange on them. Um, and these things show performance on all sorts of critical metrics. Um, the profit and loss, balance sheet and cash flow are written on, on wall height whiteboards in the team's meeting room. Um, and in fact, I went to the electrical division uh, and each week, all 160 staff gather for the re-forecast of the monthly figures. Can you imagine in, in a business getting every single human being who works in it, spending half an hour in one room at one time doing a reforecast from scratch for what you're going to do through to the end of the month. There is no mystery about their figures, right? Measurement is key. And so, and, and uh, so, you know, you've got a, an engine shipping thing there for the, for the month, you know, what do they need to do to, to, uh, to hit their numbers? Um, and the picture on the right, um, the lady who was showing me around uh, when I was asking about, you know, reward systems and so on, she flipped her uh, ID card over and said, it's really clear what our reward's going to be. It's, it's on the back of our ID card, right? So, uh, so when we're in that meeting and we, we hear what the profit before tax is going to be, uh, you just look down and see which level reward you're going to earn. So it's, um, it's, a, it's a very, um, very open um, system. And one of the things, talking with Jack, one of the things that he was most proud of uh, is that his uh, uh, hourly workers at SRC um, had more money in the company's stock than they had in their house. Their shares in their company were more valuable in their house through what they'd created together. It's very, very inspiring. So worth a look if you're in the States um, and a great example of, um, of measuring. Hello, Rob. Just, just by way of measuring and, and without trying to interrupt, just if I had a glass, I'd tinkered here for three minutes, mate. Yes, that's, that's, uh, that's what I'm aiming for, Bill. Thank you. Just a, just a heads up, that's all, mate. Thank you. So to recap, 
There are three crucial spheres of energy that require our attention, plus three enabling blades that connect them, and the central spindle of leadership that controls the performance, the rate of climb, the smoothness of the ride. So where is the energy dissipating in your business? Is there an enabler that needs attention? How about leadership? In your business, what's the main challenge? Because as we see, you know, if you, if you insert that effort into that part of the model, it has the flow through. And that, that's why I designed the model in this way, so that you could actually, um, we could break down a framework where you could see how to make the, make the most important impact. And with that challenge in mind, what's a key action you could take? What will you do to shift the needle in your business to have the impact you know it can make? One key action, maybe a couple of key actions. So in, in my view, we have an opportunity to create something truly great. We just need to work out what great means to us and what's in the way of that. To drive the growth, the performance, the valuation of the business, whilst making it easier for us to run as leaders. The prize for us is significant. I trust that learning about the propelling performance model has uh, been interesting and useful to you and that you'll use what we've shared today to help your own business. Perhaps thinking about the model as a diagnostic in the business, you know, where, where should I use some of these ideas um, to, uh, to tweak up or tune up the performance? Having done that, is there an element of the model for deeper work, perhaps each month or each quarter, to build, uh, to build that piece of organisational muscle? For those who'd like to go deeper, um, there's, uh, there's an opportunity to get the book uh, from my website at robertnancurvis.com forward slash book. Um, I recently launched a podcast, which every two weeks is having a, um, uh, an, an added uh, interesting speaker. Um, so that's at the forward slash podcast. And I have a complimentary leadership insights column that uh, comes out every, every two weeks. So thank you um, for all of you for being part of this uh, uh, presentation today. Um, and special thanks to Next Tech for their support of this forum series and, uh, and particularly to Ivan Kay and BBG for initiating this business network. <laughs>